بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. It's very nice to be back here at MCC. Alhamdulillah, I've been here a couple times, and it's always nice to come back and talk about a very important topic, one that impacts all of us, and one that is generally not talked about very much. If you think about this, if you think about our existence, it's very interesting. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions that there was a time when we were not in existence, at least in this form, this body, and there was no mention. Like the most wealthy, powerful, successful person in the world. There was a time when nobody even knew that such a person would exist. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions, "Hala ta'ala al-insani hinu min al-dhari lam yakun shay'an mithkura." That you know, we think a lot highly of ourselves, but there was a time when you were nothing, and there was no mention of you, and there was no mention of you know your your coming and your future or anything. You were completely in a, you know in a non-existent uh, state, at least in the physical sense. And then we live this life, and all of us know that at one point we're all going to die. That there's nobody who is audacious enough. Although there's all kinds of movements today to try to, you know, uh, extend life and uh, increase youth and you know live forever. Everybody knows that all of these things are not going to work, uh, and that at one day we're all going to die. But the difference between the first state and the third state, so there's the first state before we exist, and then this existence of ours, and then after we die, is that after we die, our we have the ability to be remembered. Like you have a chance in this world to be remembered, to do something such that people remember you. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions this: "وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَأَثَارَهُمْ." That their, their, their athar, their the, the legacy that they leave behind, and so this is something really amazing. That if we think about it, we have a chance in this world to do things, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will write those things, and also the legacy that we leave behind. And so that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today: is how do we plan for when we are not here in such a way that we. Uh, leave a legacy, and that we fulfill our religious obligations, and that we take care of those that are uh, that we are responsible for. All of those things together. But since I've done this presentation a couple times, or at least discussed this topic a few times here, I wanted to first ask you uh, what are some of the topics you want to hear about tonight, so that we can uh, address them, inshallah. During this presentation, so basically, why'd you come here? So feel free, and I don't know if there's any way. I know there's uh, people that are watching online, and you'll share the chat. So you, you, uh, for those that are online, if you want to write into the chat uh, and say basically, what do you want to hear about today? So one yes. One of the things you know, I'd like to ask is the complications that happen if you. Don't leave a will behind. Okay. And how does it I can repeat the questions? So how, yeah. How does it uh, impact the uh, that are left behind? Okay. Yeah. Very good. So there was a there's a a question about essentially what happens if you don't create a plan, and how complicated does that? Uh, what kind of sort of complicated mess or what happens if you don't create a plan? How how difficult is it for the people that you leave behind? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So practical questions like how much does this cost? How long does it take? You know, I understand we need to do it, but how do we go about actually achieving that goal? Understood. Like practical. Yes. What else? Okay. The question is, what is the difference between a will and a trust? Okay. So all of these are relatively practical, which is good. Yes. Okay, 
So you, the question was, how is this plan that you create uh, executed such that it's sort of uh, self-executing in the sense that this is something you do when you're alive, but it only goes into effect when you're not around? And how do we make sure that that whole thing works? Okay, good. So that's another sort of practical execution question. Let me ask on this side. Anything else? Sure. Okay, very good. So, uh, property taxes. Um, oh, this plan that we create, how does it impact taxes? Or maybe framed differently, uh, how can we try to lower our taxes uh, or at least ensure that they don't go up uh, in, this, in this planning uh, stage? Yes, anything else? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay, so two things there about basically wealth inside of a marriage. Um, we're going to talk about this. Uh, in essence, who owns what? How do we divide that up? What happens if one spouse passes? How, what is the interrelationship between the way assets are titled and uh, beneficiary designations and account and joint titling and property uh, ownership with Islamic inheritance? Uh, that's one very important uh, discussion. And then also uh, the question about converts and where do they leave their money and essentially what options does a person have if they don't have Muslim uh, heirs who would otherwise inherit from their mandatory uh, residuary estate, right? Okay, good. Uh, any, a couple, maybe one or two more? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, good. So another sort of like just sticking with the theme of practical execution of documents. Uh, once you do create this thing, how do you update it? I mean, life happens. Uh, there could be, you know, marriage, divorce, birth, de death, change in financial situation, change in assets. A number of things can happen and, and naturally will happen over the course of someone's life. Uh, so how do you update this thing? Uh, very good. Any last things you want me to cover? I think we're going to run out of time. <laughs> uh, very good. So we're going to try to do that. Uh, and I will also mention uh, two things. One, uh, sort of first, by way of disclaimer, um, I'm an attorney. And so whenever you deal with an attorney, you know there's some fine print. Uh, which is basically that what we're going to talk about is going to be general, general advice. We're going to talk about high-level concepts. We're going to talk about Islamic inheritance. We're going to talk about uh, conventional estate planning, and we're going to talk about how we bridge those two things together. Um, but this is not legal advice for your specific situation. So if you have specific questions or you want to execute a plan, you have to uh, you know, engage an attorney Either we can help you or somebody else can assist, right? Uh, but this is just general advice that we're giving. So that way we don't, um, that way you don't sue me. Um, just so we get that out of the way. The second thing is that this conversation is actually uh, part one uh, of the weekend discussion on the topic of uh, inheritance and estate planning. Uh, tomorrow, at 3 o'clock, inshallah, uh, Abdullah and I will be having a conversation with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf at Zaytuna College on this topic of Islamic inheritance law in the United States. So that should really be, inshallah, a fascinating conversation that I'm very excited about. And we're going to talk uh, there about a lot of the, which is very interesting to me that nobody seemed to be interested in any of these topics, but the theory we're going to talk a lot about the why and the how uh, of Islamic inheritance law tomorrow with Sheikh Hamza. Um, so, so, so I'm going to 
potentially skip over a number of those points today so that you can get them tomorrow from him uh, in that conversation. And that's a conversation you can sign up for. Um, you can talk to me or Abdullah or Brother Munir. If you're not on their list, um, you can join that. Uh, so is it like tomorrow more on theological side, theory, today is more practical? Yeah, yeah, I think that's how we're going to split it a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit of theory because we have to lay the precursor to Zakalah Khair and Um but, but we are going to talk tomorrow a lot of, of theory tomorrow. Uh, in that session, Jazakallah Khairan. That's going to be on Zoom. Um, so you, you can register for it and you can get that link and you can, um, you can watch it at 3 o'clock live tomorrow, inshallah. All right, so. So uh, we're going to talk about what is Islamic inheritance law and essentially what happens when someone passes away and then what discretion do you have in what you leave behind, like how much are you allowed to do what you want with and how much is predetermined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the portion that's predetermined, where does it go and to whom and what are the rules around that. And then we're going to move to the practice side, which just seems to be the, the heavy uh, interest uh, from our audience today, which is we need to understand a little bit about the rules that govern where we live. So we have to understand California rules about probate, about intestacy, about property law, about asset ownership, and about community property. So obviously you're not going to become an expert in the few minutes that we're going to have this conversation, but at least you can get an understanding of all of these various pieces that are involved when you think about this. Then we'll talk about what are the tools, right? People mentioned wills and trusts. We'll talk about them. These are the, the conventional tools that people use to achieve their estate planning goals. Right? Are these the right tools for Muslims? If they are, how do we adjust them? You know, what do we do to make them Islamic? You know, we'll talk about that. Um, and then basically we're trying to navigate two different legal systems concurrently. Like we have Islamic law and we have, you know, California law and we have a, a federal tax law and we have property tax. We've got all these different things we're trying to merge together and come up with a solution for. Um, so hopefully by the end you'll appreciate a little bit of the compl complexity that's involved. Um, and then we'll have time for questions and answers if your questions have not been addressed. Uh, but try to save them for the end, just so that we can keep the flow. That said, if there's something on a particular slide that you want to uh, like have some clarity about, just raise your hand and feel free to ask. But just specific to that slide, uh, inshallah. So, so, and then we're going to have Maghrib in the middle. So I'm going to try to get more of the theory uh, completed before Maghrib, and then we'll do maybe the practice after Muslim. So, what are we talking about when we are covering inheritance law? Basically, what happens to your stuff after you die? Okay? That's like the gist of it, to, to, to kind of really simplify it. You know, there's terminology in every field, and that terminology is often one that we might not be familiar with, both in Arabic as well as in English. Okay? So, even in English, when you use terms like your estate, right? Like that's not a term that we use in our normal conversation. Like my estate is comprised of this and that. Like people just say, I have this, I have that, you know, this. So just simplify it. Like what happens to your stuff after you pass away? Okay. Now, what is your stuff? What is your stuff comprised of? Tell me. House? What else? Bank accounts, what else? Cars, jewelry, stocks, what else? Antiques, personal property, right? Stuff in your house, what else? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're not gonna divvy that up, right? <laughs> so, so we're gonna, we're, okay, so good. So your stuff uh, includes anything that can be distributed upon your death that you have some ownership of, okay? That you have ownership of, that is something that will have to be distributed, whether it's a lot or whether it's a little. Now, I'm sorry? Pension, right? 401k, right? For a lot of people, their biggest asset is actually their retirement accounts. That's actually the biggest asset for a lot of people, right? Maybe their house, especially in California, 
right? And then their retirement accounts, right? And how do we handle those retirement accounts? Um, so, so anything that you have, a lot of people think this exercise of estate planning is something that only very rich people should do. There's this you know, sort of misconception in society at large, but even within the Muslim community, right? Like, I don't have a lot, so therefore I don't need to do much. And what we'll see is that, no, that's not the case. مِمَّا قَلَّ مِنْهُ أَوْ Right? That there's there's going to be inheritance. It might be of a lot. It might be of a little. But whatever you have, it's got to be distributed. Okay? So these are just some kind of points here uh, that we all acknowledge that we're going to die, that we have something. We have some assets. Um, and we can't take them with us. And somebody else is going to get them. So once we understand that, then it allows us to prepare and think about uh, this subject of inheritance law. Now, if you think about the... Um, there we go, a little slow. Uh, if you think about the goals and wisdoms of Islamic inheritance law, like why do we need to do this? Why? First and foremost, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us to do so. This is really, really important. It's amazing. When we think of religion, normally we think of like Maghrib, you know, Salah, reading Quran, Zakat, right? We think of the ritual worship as the parameters of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated for us. And yet the most explicit injunction in the Quran is inheritance law. This is incredible. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself lays out these rules. Again, we're going to talk more in detail tomorrow, but I just want to impress this point, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in very elaborate, with a very elaborate scheme in Surah Nisa, ayahs number 11 and 12, lays out the who gets what. And he says that, يُسِيكُمُ That Allah is giving you a wasiyah about your children. And he says, وَسِيَّةً مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَلِيمٌ Right? And he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he says, these are the limits of Allah. تِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ So why do we do this? Why, do, why are we here? First and foremost, because Allah has instructed us to. And so we want to, uh, we want to follow Allah's commandment. And he actually says in this ayah that whoever follows, this ayah comes right after the ayat of inheritance. Whoever follows Allah's rules is promised Jannah. And whoever transgresses upon the limits of Allah is promised hellfire for eternity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. So this is actually a very, very uh, important injunction. Now, in addition, there's other things here uh, which are kind of tertiary uh, about justice for our heirs. We believe Allah says, Inna Allah kana aliman hakim. Allah is most knowledgeable, most wise. He's set up this scheme and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we follow it this is this distribution pattern will be just okay and if it were up to us we might do things that are unfair and you know if you look at modern society people leave their wealth in all kinds of crazy ways some people leave uh, all of their wealth to one child and, and completely disinherit another one because that one you know didn't come visit them for their birthday or something right this happens, right? Uh, another, uh, sometimes people cut out all their kids altogether and they leave their wealth to uh, a charity because they think that the charity is more deserving than their kids. Or maybe their kids have enough. Or whatever. In some cases, people leave everything to their pets. Um, <laughs> they do. <laughs> because uh, the pets are the most loyal to the people when they get home every day, like who jumps on top of them, who's the most excited to see them, it's not their kids, it's their, it's their dog, right, so they set up a trust and they spend all this money and they're leaving everything to their kids, we laugh, but it's real, right, and so this, these rules are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maintaining family bonds, I mean, has anyone in the audience uh, heard of or dealt with a dispute of a family member in relation to inheritance? Anybody had like a family fight that they've seen before about inheritance? No? Yeah, I mean almost everybody has a story of someone dying and then this really harmonious family that seemed to be totally intact, particularly on the second parent's death, 
just completely falls apart, right? Because of inheritance disputes. And so these rules Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out because they are going to impact everyone. And then we have a, a massive opportunity as a, uh, as a community to build institutions through this uh, exercise of estate planning. Um, most wealth in America is transferred uh, upon death. So there's lifetime giving where people donate, but the large, large gifts are done upon death. And that's where endowments are built and institutions are established and oqaf and, you know, kind of really where you can get sustainability because you can leave these legacy gifts. And the Sharia is going to allow us to do that uh, to an extent. Um, and this knowledge is incredibly virtuous, right? This exercise that we're like doing here of learning about Islamic inheritance rules, it's practical, but it's also tremendously rewarding. And the Prophet ﷺ says, تَعَلَّمُ الْفَرَائِضِ uh, learn inheritance rules and teach it to others. فَإِنَّهُ نِصْفُ الْعِلْمِ And it's half of all knowledge, he says. Half of all knowledge. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and he also said it will be the first thing that will be lifted from my ummah. Meaning, uh, you're not going to hear much about it. Right? Like, it's not going to be the topic of your standard Jumu'ah khutbah. It's not going to be the topic of your usual, um, you know, halaqa. Uh, true or not? Like, have you heard khutbahs and discussions and halaqahs on this topic? Or? Right. Most of you have been going to the masjid for your whole life. Right? How many times have you heard this topic discussed? Almost never. It's amazing. Again, this is the prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu We'll talk more about this tomorrow, so I'm going to skip over that. Now, defining your estate. So, defining your estate. So, we're moving now from the, from the background to the, to the uh, what are we covering. So, we said defining your estate is whatever you own. Whatever your stuff is, that's going to be the topic of our discussion. Is When we think about estate planning, that's what we're planning. Now, there's a really interesting... Um, there's a really interesting basis for this uh, notion of estate planning in the Qur'an itself. Which is uh, in Surah Al-Kahf, where... You know, which we read on Fridays. So hopefully you read it today. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says about Surah Al-Kahf, just on the side, right, that this, whoever reads it, it's nur, it's light uh, for that person for the week. Like, it's your light for the week. And whoever reads and memorizes the first 10 ayat, another narration, the last 10 ayat, it's protection from the Dajjal. So in Surah Al-Kahf, there are a number of stories. One of those stories is the story of Musa and Al-Khidr. One of the lessons in the story of Musa and Al-Khidr is that they were traveling and they came across a wall. And they, were in a, they went to a, a town and they asked the people for some food and the people rejected. They were stingy. So then they found this wall and Al-Khidr rebuilt the wall. The wall was falling down and Al-Khidr rebuilt the wall. So you guys know this story. So Musa alayhi salam says like, you know, you can charge them, right? Like you did some work for them. You should maybe, we should get paid for it, right? And then uh, that's the end of their journey. And then Al-Khidr explains later that why did he do that? Anybody know? There was a treasure for orphans, right? There were So there was the father. What did he do? What did he do? He buried his wealth. Okay? He buried his wealth. He must have realized what? He's going to die. And so his act of estate planning to protect his wealth for his children, especially from these greedy people, was that he buried it. And the Quran describes him as a righteous person. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of those kids, sent Musa and Al-Khidr and rebuilt the wall and then hopefully when they got older then they're able to, you know, procure their wealth. So this idea of protecting your wealth so that the next generation can receive it and benefit from it, not just the next generation but your dependents and your family, this is uh, really what we're thinking about when we are engaged in uh, in uh, estate planning. So now, 
what happens when a person passes away? Like, what is the order of distributions when a person passes away? Let's say, if I were to pass, how, what are the, what's the first thing that's supposed to happen? Loans have to be paid? What happens even before that? What, like, naturally, what's first? Burial, right? The very first thing is you've got to have money to get buried. Now, alhamdulillah, our communities are generous. And typically, this happens. Like, either the family will pay, uh, or the, you know, the, the, the Muslim community will pick it up. But it is the responsibility of the person, right? And so part of planning is ensuring that you maybe have set aside money to make sure that those burial and funeral expenses can be covered. Um, how much does it cost to die in Pleasanton? 7500 So it's like double Phoenix. Um, uh, <laughs> so I'm visiting from Phoenix. Uh, but that makes sense, right? It costs like double to live here and double to die here. Um, so, so that's not an insignificant amount of money, right? It's not an insignificant amount of money for some people. They would want to make sure that that money is allocated such that they don't become a burden on their remaining family members. So you don't have to they don't have to cover those costs or the Muslim community doesn't have to cover those costs. So part of this proactive planning is first to make sure that these funeral and burial costs are covered, right? So that's what comes out first from the estate of the, of the person. What's second? What's next? Debts. Okay. So money you owe, okay? Actually, money that people owe you is part of your estate, if we go backwards, right? So, you know, if Abdullah owes me $10,000, that's part of my estate. That's part of the money that's supposed to come in. But if I owe Abdullah $10,000, that debt has to be paid before any of my wealth is given to other people, okay? And this is really important because we live in a society where people are really drowning in debt, okay? So, like, there's every level of debt that you can imagine, right? There's credit cards, there's consumer debt, there's student loans, there's car mortgages, the car payments, there's a home mortgage, there, there's, you know, uh, there's so many different kinds of debts and then there's personal loans that people might borrow from other people, right? So we have to really think about how do we ensure that our debts are repaid? This, again, requires some level of planning because كُلُّ نَفْسٍ دَائِطَةُ الْمَوْتِ We're all gonna die, we just don't know when, right? So if someone's like, well, you know, I'll get around to it one day, Inshallah, we get around to it, but perhaps if we don't have a plan, that would be very problematic. So we don't want to be, and, his, and, and, and the Prophet ﷺ would actually not pray janazah over someone who had debts outstanding. In one narration that even the shaheed, the martyr who gave up their life, I mean, is the highest pinnacle of sacrifice, that person's sins are all forgiven, except what? debts that they owe. That's not a sin, but their debts are not forgiven, right? So you're allowed to have a debt. Uh, we're not talking about permissible, impermissible, riba, none of that stuff. We're just simply talking about money that you owe people. Money that's owed needs to be cleared, right? So, uh, so that's the second thing. Now, there's basically two classes of debts. There's debts that you owe to people. Uh, those have to be cleared. And then there's debts. So let's stop here because they said uh, uh, Salah is right after uh, Adhan. So we'll pick up with the topic of debt and then we'll move to the practical uh, considerations right after Salah. Right? Okay, there were a couple more. I'm just going to mention them uh, that people ask me a Maghrib so that uh, if I forget, you can remind me. Uh, they were about having assets overseas. How do we account for things that are, you know, when we say our stuff is, our, our, our estate is our stuff, uh, and this tariqa, like what about all the things that uh, a person may have uh, outside of the United States? And also how do we account and what uh, type of planning is required for uh, children with special needs? <clears throat> so we'll talk about that as well, inshallah. So, bismillah wa ala picking up where we left off. We said that, uh, we established that this science of 
Islamic inheritance law is one that is relevant to all of us, that will impact every single one of us in multiple ways, either as an heir of somebody else's estate or as the decedent who will leave their own estate. Um, and we talked about uh, why we then need to learn it, what are the objectives of the science, what are the virtues associated with it, and then we moved to uh, a discussion of Islamic inheritance law as uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And then we started to move towards the practical still within Islamic inheritance laws framework. So we haven't come to uh, uh, the integration piece yet about California and living here as Muslims in America. We're still on a little bit of theory with respect to Islamic inheritance law. So we said the first thing that happens after a person dies according to Islamic inheritance law uh, and also according to state law, this is actually matching uh, under state law as well, is that the first thing you have to cover and the first cost that comes out of an estate are funeral and burial expenses. The second are debts, and we talked about debts uh, that a person owes. And we briefly, right before uh, Salat al-Maghrib, mentioned that there also is a category of debts known as debts huququllah, uh, or debts to Allah. Now, what is that referring to? What do you think that's referring to? Right, so basically, religious obligations that you had in your lifetime that you may not have fulfilled. Okay? This is a category of debt. For example, the most common example is what? Huh? Maybe even more common than that. Hajj, right? So Hajj is an example where it became obligatory upon you because you have the financial means, you're planning to go, but you died before you were able to go, right? So that was a debt then that you owed to Allah, right? And so uh, I, I, I think specifically about Hajj that, uh, Abdullah, is this in every madhab allows for the payment on Hajj? Are you, do you know? I believe in Hajj and the other, the other religious obligations about Salah and, and such, there's some discussion between the Madahib. But basically, if you have missed religious obligations, uh, you can uh, pay the, the, the due or you can stipulate in your estate plan that I missed this zakat or I've you know, been accumulating this zakat that I'm supposed to pay and I haven't paid it yet or uh, whether it's fast or salah according to some of the madahib uh, and hajj, you can basically stipulate those things. Those things will come out of your wasiya share. Okay, so I'm defining these as shares. What is the wasiya share? The wasiya share is basically the one third that is discretionary. Up to one third of your wealth after you pay the funeral and burial costs, after you pay off any debts of now, let's say we started off with $100, we had $5 of funeral and burial costs. We have $5 of debt that I had to pay. Now I'm left with how many? Friday, I just want to make sure we're still, still here. We've got 90 left. I'm allowed how many as a discretionary bequest? And this will see a share. Yeah? 30. Confident? Yes. Okay. So I have a discretionary portion I'm allowed to utilize to give to anybody who's not going to inherit in the residuary share in the fara'id. Okay? So basically whoever's not going to inherit from category number four, I can use in category number three. That could mean what type of examples? What are some examples? What, what, what would you use this wasiya share for? Sadaqa, right? You can use it for sadaqa jariya, right? The famous hadith we're all familiar with that after a person dies in qatar amalu, right? That person's deeds are finished except for three things and among them are sadaqa jariya. Right? Now, especially for high net worth individuals, okay? because we'll come to the hadith, uh, uh, we'll come to the hadith, but basically if you have a lot of money and your family is going to be okay and they're going to have enough, then you'll be more inclined and you're more encouraged to give from this discretionary portion. If you have young dependents, it doesn't make a lot of sense to give your money to charity when you have you know, a three-year-old and a four-year-old and they have to live their life, right? So this is something that perhaps changes over the course of one's life. Um, but I think it's incredibly powerful. I think this is an opportunity for Muslims in America, um, especially those who have adult children whose 
who are financially stable and independent themselves to utilize their share to build endowments. And the reason that the giving from the wasiya and this bequest is more powerful than lifetime giving is what? I, I'm curious if anyone can... Get, why do you think it's easier to do this? There's a couple reasons. There's a psycholo psychological reason and there's a practical reason. What do you think? You can't buy stuff with it when you're dead. Yeah, it's harder to, to part with your money when you're alive, right? So frankly, if you give in your life, it's, more, it's, it, it's probably more rewarding because you're actually you know, distancing yourself from the money and that's hard. But there's another reason which is that upon your death, you have access to give more. Namely, your retirement accounts. Okay? So you can't today, if you wanted to give all of your retirement accounts to the masjid, right? There's not an easy, tax-efficient way to do this. Okay? But upon death, you can. So it opens up for a lot of people a larger pool of assets, potentially illiquid assets. Maybe the home they're living in, maybe their 401k or their retirement accounts or so on and so forth. So on death, your estate might actually be larger than what you have access to on a day-by-day -day basis, okay? So this is a powerful um, opportunity. And then what's left, whatever's left after all of these things, which is going to be, uh, whatever it is, is going to go to predetermined heirs that the Qur'an, by and, by and large, most of the rules come directly from the Qur'an itself. This is what makes this field pretty interesting, is that there's not as many differences across madahib uh, because the rules are so unambiguous in the Qur'an itself. There are dis differences, but they're not so significant. So talking about the wasiya, this is the famous hadith of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, uh, in which he uh, tells the, asks the Prophet wasallam that I have um, money. Now this is the second example of estate planning. We gave one before, which was what? No, uh, the example of estate planning in the Qur'an, we said, where that righteous man in Surah Al-Kahf planned for his children. He was planning his estate. Here again, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas is coming to the Prophet Wasallam, and what is he doing? He's planning. He thinks he's about to die or he's sort of nearing death and he says to the Prophet Wasallam, can I give two-thirds of my wealth to charity? And the Prophet Wasallam says, no, you can't. He says, can I give half? He says, no, you can't. And then he says, how about a third? And he says, a third, okay? and even a third is a lot. Okay? And the hadith continues that it's better for you to leave your dependents, uh, to leave your, your children uh, and your dependents not reliant on others. Okay? So if your children are young and such and dependent upon you, it's better for you to leave your wealth to them. But again, if the circumstance is such that a person is high net worth, um, they're going to be subject to estate taxes anyways, or their family is, you know, well off, or they don't have Islamic heirs, then definitely this is going to be a really good opportunity to use. And this is a nice, uh, the nuance of the Sharia here, that you do have some portion which is discretionary, but most of it is going to be non-discretionary, per the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, this allows you to give to more distant relatives. Um, so, you know, oftentimes when the wealth was being distributed, there are perhaps like cousins and especially where the families were living a lot closer and there's all more distant relatives. This is an opportunity to potentially give to relatives beyond the immediate sort of nuclear family that usually inherits as well. Um, now, with respect to what's left, most of it comes from ayah number 11 and 12 of Surah An-Nisa. Okay? So I'm going to just derive a few quick principles uh, from the verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, you'll see, kumullahu fi awladikum. mithlu unthayin. The very first principle is that, is what? It's number one on the screen. Huh? <laughs> right? It's a two to one ratio of male to female. Okay? Like for similarly situated uh, uh, levels. So basically, when we're talking about children, okay, it's two to one boy to girl. That's the very first principle mentioned in the ayah. Allah 
is giving you a wasiyah with respect to your children. And then he says, Okay? This, is, this will be one of our conversation points for tomorrow. Because this is a question that a lot of people ask. Uh, is this rule still applicable today? Yes. Right? This is Quran. This is unambiguous Quran. Right? And so a lot of people uh, have questions about this verse and the application of this verse, right? What's important is to understand that these rules, I'm just going to give one point here, these rules apply to what you leave behind on death. So if someone loves their daughter and wants to make sure that their daughter has enough, what's a simple example of something they can do for their daughter? Hiba. They can give whatever they want in their lifetime, right? They can do whatever they want in their lifetime. This rule applies upon death, okay? That it's two to one uh, upon death. Uh, and if you are interested more in this discussion, then inshallah tomorrow we will uh, dive deeper into this discussion. If you only have one daughter, what does she get? I'm sorry, if you have two daughters, Two daughters, no sons, they get two or more daughters, no sons, they get two-thirds of the entirety. If you have one daughter she and no sons, she's going to get half. Okay? Now, then we move to the parents. Uh, for those that like haven't studied this verse or like really appreciated it, this is so amazing. Like the Quran with such precision, with fractions. Um, and in fact, algebra was invented in part to solve Islamic inheritance problems. Like, this is amazing. Like, our tradition is so rich, right? That these rules that we find in the Quran, that, you know, our scholars and mathematicians and scientists, they utilize them to benefit humanity. So now we go to parents. Now, basically, if you have parents who are living, they are most of the time going to get what? One-sixth. Okay? So if your parents are alive, most of the time they're going to get one-sixth. This is very different from state law. Like in America, if you die and you have a wife or you have a husband or you have children, what do your parents get? Any state. No, let's assume you don't have any plan. Huh? Do your parents get anything? Yes. No. There's no idea like this, I, this idea of like you have this indebtedness to your parents and that you have an ethic to take care of them and all of that. Like that doesn't exist in this society. Right? The intestacy rules, the default state laws, are intended to match what people would want. Like in other words, the, the law is created by whom? By people, the legislators, who are sort of creating a default system that they assume this is what most people would want. What would most people want? Most of it to go to my spouse or then to my children, right? Like nowhere in there is this conception that you have an ethic and a duty to continue to take care of your parents after death. So this is, this is like very different. Um, however, there are situations in which if you don't have children uh, or there are no siblings, the mother's share increases. She gets a third. If there are no children but you have uh, siblings, uh, meaning two or more, then the mother's share is going to drop back down to a sixth. Okay? This happens after مِنْ بَعْدِ وَصِيَةٍ يُوصِي بِهَا أَوْدَيْن After the wasiyah and after the debts. After the debts and the wasiyah have been paid. Then we go into this uh, uh, distribution. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ لَا تَذْرُونَ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ لَكُمْ نَفْعَا That your parents and your children, you don't know who would have more benefit. Like, you don't know if it were up to you, you might think, well, maybe I should give more to my parents because I owe them everything. Or maybe you could make an argument that my kids are young, I should give more to them, they have the rest of their life in front of them. You can make all kinds of different arguments, people can argue anything, right? Are there any lawyers here? Yeah, there's a couple. Actually, no, not raising their hands, but... <laughs> right? So these guys can make arguments about anything. Right? And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying 
that faridatan min Allah in Allah kana aliman hakima. These are rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most knowledgeable, the most wise, has set forth and they're mandatory. Right? In other words, submit to them. Like this is a test. A lot of people are like, I nah, you know, that's good theory, but my situation's kind of different. You know, my family's special, right? Uh, no, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that these rules apply to everyone. Now, when it comes to spouses, spouses also have a share. Uh, by the way, if anyone uh, really wants to test the, um, the accuracy or the, the ability of a hafiz, you ask them to recite these ayat. <laughs> this is like the hafiz test, right? To be able to recite these ayat. Because they're tricky, right? It's all fractions. So, uh, the, if a married woman passes away without children, uh, what does the husband get? Half. And if she has children, he receives? Right? A quarter. What does she get? What does the widow get? وَلَهُنَّ الرُّبُعُ مِمَّا تَرَكْتُمْ إِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَكُمْ وَلَدٌ فَإِنْ كَانَ لَكُمْ وَلَدٌ فَلَهُنَّ الثُّمُنُ مِمَّا تَرَكْتُمْ If you pass away and you are survived by your wife, what does the wife get? I mean, the answers are on the screen, right? A quarter or an eighth. So what are you noticing in the two scenarios? Right? The husband actually gets double the share in this case of what the wife would get respectively from each other's estates. We're going to talk all about the who owns what and how, what is it, all of that. But still in the realm of Islamic inheritance rules, if Aisha dies with you know, $100, this is how her estate would be distributed. And if Ahmed dies, this would be how his estate would be distributed. مِن بَعْدِ وَصِيَةٍ تُوصُونَ بِهَا أَوْدَيْنَ Again, after <coughs> the debts and the wasiya have been paid. Alright. And then we have the situation of the kalala. Who's that? Who's that? Who's the kalala? وَإِنْ كَانَ رَجُلٍ يُورَثُ kalala. This person doesn't have doesn't have kids, and ascendants and descendants. descendants. There's different definitions of who the Kalala is, right? And there's two verses about Kalala. Um, let's skip over it, inshallah, in the interest of time. Most people that are going to engage in this planning are going to either have kids or are going to have parents um, or uh, such. Uh, so, so we're going to skip over it, but we can come back to it at the end if we need to. Um, what's interesting about What's interesting about Islamic inheritance law is that inheritance law is basically looking backwards after death and estate planning is looking prospectively. So when what we're engaging in is we're trying to plan to make sure that these rules are applied after we die. Right? So, so far we've been talking about Ahmed died, what do we do with his wealth? First we figure out what he owned, then we figure out who were the people that he left behind, and then we figure out how do we split it up, right? That's what we've been doing so far. Now we're going to move to, okay, Ahmed is still alive. So now we want to try to plan to make sure that Ahmed's stuff gets distributed the right way while he's still living, okay? This whole question of execution and such. Yes? With the parents, number Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So at the parents' level, it's not double for the male. That's correct. Yeah. Wali abawayhi li kulli wahidin Right? So this, this notion of two to one doesn't always apply. There are situations in which the female gets more than the male, double the male. There are situations in which they inherit equally. And there are situations in which... I'm sorry, there are situations in which the male gets double of the female, there are situations in which it's equal, and there are situations in which the female actually gets more than the male. So for number five, when the mother receives the third, the father receives... The father becomes asaba, right? So uh, he's going to get residuary. He's going to get what's left. So it's going to depend upon who else is in the equation. Follow up to number four. So if there are no children, parents receive one-sixth. 
left. Very good. So, so it wouldn't be five sixths that would be left over, but there would be two thirds potentially. Each. Let's assume that. Let's assume there's two parents, right? They're going to get one sixth each. So, what happens to the rest, right? The rest is a category known as aslaba, usually, which are going to be residuary heirs. So, we're going to apply all these Quranic fractions, and then we're going to come up to a, a total. That total may or may not be one, right? It might be more than one in which we would reduce them, but more likely than not, it's going to be less than one. There's going to be some leftover, okay? And so there's going to be a leftover, which is then going to go to those residuary heirs. Let's take some examples. I think this will help. Uh, okay, so we've got Hamza. Hamza dies. He's survived by Widad and Maymuna and Suleiman and Dua. Okay, so he's got a wife who is Widad, he's got a mother who is Maimuna, and then he's got a son, Suleiman, and he's got a daughter, Dua. Okay? Alright, so what does Widad get? Six, eighth, what? One eighth. The wife gets one eighth because because kids. kids, right? He has kids. She gets an eighth. Okay. Maimuna is mom. The parentheses is supposed to give you the relationship. Okay. So Maimuna gets what? One sixth. One sixth. Right. Remember the parents get one sixth. Okay. Wali abu ayhi kulli wahid min Suleiman and Dua. So we've got a son and a daughter now. What happens? Was this one of the scenarios that we covered in the ayah? The Dakari, Mithlu Hadl Unthayen. Okay, so basically they become Asaba. They take the residuary at a two to one ratio. So we give the one eighth, we give the one sixth of the what's left. We're going to give two to one boy to girl. Okay? See some like I haven't done math in a long time. Looks <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, just a refresher. Okay, now Hamza dies again, and this time uh, he's got his uh, his wife with dad. He's got his father, Faris, and he's got Suleiman, Dania, and Dua. So what happened is he's got he's got an extra daughter. And then this time it's his father and not his mother. Okay? So who gets what in this scenario? What does the wife get? Does her share change? She still gets the same share. Okay? And the father? One sixth. The same as the mom, right? Same share as the mom would have gotten. And if the mom is there, she's also going to get one sixth. They're both going to get one sixth if they're alive. Now in this case, we have two daughters and a son. So who gets what? How many shares do you make at that point? Four shares. Four shares. Four shares. You're going to make four shares. You're going to give one fourth to each of the daughters, and you're going to give two shares to the son of the what's left. Again, after the funeral, burial costs, the debts, and the wasiya are given, of the what's left, we're going to pay those first shares, Quranic shares, and then of the what's left from there, we're going to do two to one boy to girl. All right. So... Hamza, Widad died this time. Okay. So, so this time the woman, the wife died and she's survived by her husband and her father and her mother. So who does she not have? She doesn't have children. Okay. So what's missing from this equation? What do you need to answer this question? You need some knowledge of whether she has siblings or not. It's very good, right? So you need to have the full picture, okay? So let's assume, let's assume that sh this is the full picture, okay? This is the full picture. There's nobody else involved. This is all she's got. She's got a husband, no children. What does the husband get? What does the husband get? 
Okay, how many, yeah. <laughs> how many fractions are there in the Quran? This is a trivia. How many fractions are there in the Quran? No, that's too many. I'm just actual fractions. How many is it? Six? Huh? Eight? I forgot. You can double check for me. Okay. Uh, we have one half, we have one third, we have one fourth, we have one sixth, and we have one eighth. And two thirds. And two thirds. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, so in this case, the husband gets a quarter. What does the father and mother get? And? Okay. I'm going to cancel this uh, example. <laughs> okay. Because this example actually gives you... Uh, this example is intended to show you that there is some uh, nuance to the rules. This is actually an advanced example. Okay? Yes? I think look at the length of life, length of life uh, of the person more than the gender in in some cases perhaps so uh, so the second generation that they of parents that they are not expected to live long gets always less than the husband and much less than the children so this is, I think, because we are always seen as, you know, we, we, uh, we do with the generation, with the genders, yeah. uh, you know, bias to gender. But in many cases, the woman, if it's a daughter, for example, receives more than the father uh, or the husband. Uh, okay, so so so, so, so you mentioned yeah, yeah, here. So we're going to skip this point. Yeah, I think one good point you're making here is that. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about gender. Uh, basically, the, the rights are based upon proximity of relationship. That's actually how the, the shares are allocated. It's based on blood first and foremost, right? This is very much blood relationships. The only non-blood relation that inherits is what? Spouse, right? And we're basically looking at proximity and going more distant when it comes to inheritance rules. Okay. Table that third example. That's a level two example. Okay, so that's that's for uh, uh, for uh, after you've studied enough, so we can go into uh, the, that example. But the first two are straightforward enough. Okay, so um, can we close that door? Um, so now let's move from theory, uh, and and do understand that I wanted to go through those rules because I wanted to give you an appreciation for how rich the tradition is, and also because it's so virtuous to learn Islamic inheritance rules. The Prophet says, Man bihi khayran, fi deen. If Allah intends good for a person, He gives them a deep understanding of the religion. So we want to like try and always be students. You know, if we haven't learned a new subject, this is an opportunity to learn a new subject and really uh, dive a little deeper. Now we're going to transition to, we live in America, and you live in California. Uh, I'm an attorney, uh, an estate planning attorney that's licensed both in California and Arizona. So basically my job is to create plans for clients that sort of try to achieve these goals, right? That try to in in integrate Islamic inheritance into the plan. So what does that mean? In order to do that, you've got to know a few things. First thing you've got to know is who owns what? When is this relevant? Remember we said that the, the, the estate is defined by your stuff. Okay? So, is it an easy question to define what is yours? When is it complicated? When is joint? Right? So if you're married and you've got two names on an account, does it mean it's 50-50? Not necessary, but that's what it says, right? So what happens is when people come and start these engagements with me, oftentimes they're like, well, I've got this asset with my son. I just added that name on like, you know, for good, I thought it was a good idea. And this one, I added my daughter because I thought maybe that was a good idea. 
and this is jointly titled, but this one, you know, my husband was traveling, so I signed it myself. And this one, the husband says my wife wasn't there, so I signed that one myself. And this one is joint. And it's all kinds of different, this one, this one. It, it, we didn't really do it intentionally. And we've got all kinds of different assets with different titles. Now, the title is going to be super important when analyzing. And the reality might be something different. The intention might be something different. And we've got to reconcile those two things together. Okay? Again, this isn't going to give you the solutions to everything. It's just going to, it's going to bring to your awareness that we have to first define what is ours. And unilaterally, inside of a marriage, you can't do that. So if you're married, and you came to me and said, I would like to create my estate plan, and 100% of the stuff that we own is actually mine. Right? Even though it's got her name on it, or even though it's got his name on it, it's actually mine. So go ahead and make it follow Sharia, uh, because it's mine. I earned it. You know, I just added his name or her name for whatever. Can you do that? Not here. <laughs> right? So, so you've got to be on the same page if you're married. A. You could do this if you did it before you got married. How? Prenup. Right? So this is a little bit to a question that was asked earlier as well. How do we manage marital finances? Right? We can do a prenup to establish what's his, what's hers from the get-go. And we can operate under a very clear um, regime. Now, most people don't do that. But that's actually a good practice. It's a sound practice. And I think it does eliminate a lot of ambiguity. But we have to understand, secondly, what's community property? I think that's number three on the bullet designation. But To your point about the prenup, so is it always a good idea to have a prenup before you get married? Like your kids, you know, when they get married, should they, should they have a prenup or not? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a digression, but it's related. So I'll answer it. Um, Is it Islamic? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's my question. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I think uh, Islam encourages the writing of contracts. Okay? This much we can establish from the Quran itself. The Quran itself encourages the writing of contracts. We have a proof for that. Allah SWT says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ida tadayantum bidaynin ida ajalim musamman faktubu. When you're writing a debt contract, and when you engage in a, a, when you're borrowing money, write it down and have two witnesses. Okay? The Quran says to have witnesses and have a written contract. Why? Because people fight about money. <laughs> right? And so we want to eliminate that. And a marital contract doesn't require uh, a written contract. Uh, it certainly doesn't require a prenup. Right? But a prenup is a contract in which you can clarify how you are going to organize your finances inside of that marriage. It can include things like the mahar, right? What the mahar is and what's owed. So it has Islamic dimensions to it. <clears throat> it will clarify the what's his and what's hers. And it can clarify uh, what happens in the event of divorce. Okay? And what happens in the event of death. Those are things that can go into a prenup. I do think it's a good idea. Okay, I think it will very much clarify um, uh, ownership of assets. And Allah forbid, if there is a problem in that marriage, it will mitigate so much of the dispute and cost of battle that is so common uh, in any divorce. Like everybody goes into a, div into a marriage happy, right? But if there is a problem, usually it's not a happy ending, right? It's usually acrimonious, right? To some level. And so you can avoid much of that by having defined everything objectively when everyone was happy. Okay, so it's 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 definitely something good uh, to do. Um, is it Islamic? It's a contract that you are you know uh, entering into, and so you can make sure that it is Islamic. Like you can put Islamic terms into it. To uh, I don't just mean like put Bismillah at the top. I mean <laughs> I just mean that. The contract itself will be within the framework of Sharia. Like you are defining your legal obligations inside of the marriage, and you are determining what's going to happen in the event of uh, the the marriage failing. Um, so I think that's something that more people should do. Now, related to that, 
uh, what's community property? What's community property? Who knows what community property is? None of you uh, have, live in California? Well, you acquire after marriage. What's community property? If you're married. Yes. Anything, unless you say otherwise, yes. Yeah, basically, whatever wealth is acquired inside of the marriage is considered community, except for a few exceptions, namely what you receive as a gift, or what you receive as inheritance, or what you came into the marriage with. Okay? So you get married, you got $10, okay? Uh, that $10 is yours, it's separate property, but if that 10 turns into 20, or let's just forget about the, what it turns into, now you have a job and you made $10 and you deposited that $10 into a separate bank account only in your name. So Ahmed works and Sara is at home not working. Ahmed earns $10 and he puts that $10 in Ahmed's bank account. Who owns what? Community. It's community property, but it's in Ahmed's bank account. Does it matter? Not for the purposes of, of distributing the community property, meaning in the case of death or divorce, right? The spouse has a claim on half of that wealth, okay? Now, this is an important point related to prenups and related to Islamic inheritance and related to the rights of women in Islam. In Islam, uh, let's invert the example I just gave and say Aisha works. Did we use Aisha? Was this the same example? Was the girl Aisha a minute ago? It was Sada? Okay. All right. I just want to see who's listening. So Sada works, okay, and Ahmed stays at home. Ahmed is playing video games all day. Sada is a physician, and she's making like $300,000. Ahmed is chilling at home playing video games. Sada earns 300 k under Islamic law. Who owns what? Under Islamic law, Sada owns what? $300,000. Okay. What does Ahmed have under Islamic law? The video games, the video games right? He's got the video games. Okay. Now, let's apply California community property law. Progressive California. Okay. Let's apply California property law to this example. He owns a video game, but what else does he own? $150,000. Okay? So, now when we're applying, this is really important to understand. Like, it's under Islamic law, she's got 100% under, uh, and he's got zero. But under California rules, it's 50-50. Okay? So, would it have been good for Sada to do a prenup? Absolutely. Right? It would have made a lot of sense. Right? Um, for her to do the prenup. Now, what are Sada's options at this point if she wants to get, uh, wants the assets to be hers? She can do a post-nup, she can do a property agreement, but he's got to agree. Which is, like, he's playing video games, he's not going to agree, right? He's chilling, okay? So, um, so, that's why the prenup is so valuable. Because you set it in advance and you get to uh, define it. Now, if you haven't defined it, you both have to agree. And you can memorialize that agreement in the form of a post nup or a transmutation or a property agreement. But again, both spouses must agree. Okay? Now, you also have to understand what the titling uh, of the assets is. So, for example, you have a home and you have it as joint tenants with the right of survivorship, a community property right of survivorship. You make this nice Islamic will, you go to a lawyer or you use one of these Islamic you know, websites. Uh, to make a will, uh, <laughs> and um, it's got, you know, halal stamp on it and it says bismillah at the top. What's going to happen on the death of the first spouse? What's going to happen? Okay, one person said probate, one person said 50%. The entire house goes to the survivor, okay? Your will did what? What did it accomplish? Nothing. Okay? Understand this point. Your will did nothing. Okay? Your spouse got 100%. With or without your will, no probate, which is good, 
So we don't end up in probate, uh, which is the court system. So, so we don't end up in the court system. But we also don't end up with the will actually doing anything. Okay? So we end up with the spouse having 100%. Some people say that's not a bad result. My spouse is a nice person. Right? They obviously, they'll take care of it. Inshallah, that's fine. Right? But there's a possibility that the spouse doesn't fulfill the obligation. There's a possibility. What are the number of possibilities? The spouse might be grieving and might never get around to it. The sp spouse might get remarried, right? If that spouse gets remarried, then potentially the new spouse might get added to the title and we end up in this chain of title where the house ends up going to second spouse's children, third party, just not where it's supposed to go, right? Completely. These aren't super far-fetched examples, right? So, um, so, so, so just understand that the titling is super, super critical when you engage in estate planning. You know, so many people are like, can I just do a down, can't the masjid just have a, a download template that I can just print out and I can do it? Like, why are we making this so complicated? Because it's complicated, right? You have to take into account all these various considerations if you want to do this correctly, right? The boilerplate stuff might work for very simple cases, right? A person's not married, they don't have a lot of assets, right? Fine, maybe it works, okay? But if you, the more you have, the more kind of it is important to uh, look at this holistically and get expert advice. Now, let's assume you don't have a, also beneficiary designations. Uh, what is a beneficiary designation? That's what controls more than a will and even more than any trust or anything. If you don't update your beneficiary designations, that's the person who's going to get the assets. Okay? So if you've got your, you know, one child or you've got your ex-wife on the beneficiary and you never updated it, that's a big problem. Right? Your estate plan doesn't work unless your beneficiaries are titled correctly. So 401ks, especially retirement accounts, um, even financial other accounts, brokerage accounts, a lot of them now have uh, options to name beneficiaries. Transfer on death, pay on death, there's different terms for these things. Um, very critical that we designate them correctly. In the absence of a plan, the default state rules would apply. Okay, so now let's assume someone dies, they don't have a will, they don't have a joint property, they don't have any beneficiary designations. What's going to happen to that property? Probate and state decides. So the state's not going to do something different every time. It's got a bunch of rules and those rules would apply. Are those rules based on Sharia? Obviously not, right? Also, that's when probate kicks in. What's probate? Anyone dealt with it? Yeah, anybody dealt with it? Nobody's dealt with it? Well, that's good. Um, uh, because it's a, a, an inefficient process. Anybody dealt with like California bureaucracy, government systems and stuff? Like, can you imagine this probate court system is a very antiquated system? Uh, and it's expensive. And lawyers actually in California are allowed to charge percentages of the estate. Okay? So they can just charge a percentage fee. Uh, so your estate even if it's not super complicated, uh, can be sort of eaten up pretty quickly in legal fees um, and court fees and time and all of this, right? Some people describe it as a lawsuit against yourself, okay? So most people that go to an estate planning attorney, like my clients that are not Muslim, just basically 100% of my clients want to avoid probate. Like everybody wants to avoid probate, whether you're Muslim or not Muslim. But if you're a Muslim, there's like a, 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 an additional reason. Like why in the world do you want to have this like judge have anything to do with your estate or this probate referee or whatever? Like we don't want other people involved in our stuff, especially people who don't know anything about us or, or that don't know anything about our faith or whatever. Now the beauty of living here is that the state allows you to do whatever you want if you take the proactive steps to do it. These are default rules. These rules will apply if you don't proactively make a legally binding plan. You have to meet certain requirements. You have to do the work. You have to get the witness. You know, you have to meet all the requirements. If you do, then you can basically bypass the system and you can do whatever you want. Again, if you're married, you both have to agree. You can only do perhaps your portion of the estate otherwise. Now, uh, you also have to consider taxes, okay? There's different taxes. There's taxes you pay in life. I mean, there's income taxes. There's taxes when you sell an asset. Those are called capital gains taxes. There are property taxes. Anybody heard of Prop 19? Were you guys following the rule change a few years ago? 
those of you that have houses in the Bay Area uh, that you bought a long time ago, okay, those houses have a low property tax basis, okay? And uh, if one of the things that most people want to avoid is having a reassessment to fair market value. So like you take an example of somebody who bought a house um, in the Bay Area, let's say 30, 40 years ago for like $200,000 and now it's $2 million, right? Their property tax basis is extremely low and their neighbor might be paying a lot more. So what does the government want? It wants to reassess. It wants to get that higher property tax. You want to try to lock in as you know that low property tax basis. So this planning also now is complicated by the fact that there was a new law a couple of years ago that made this planning a lot harder where the state is trying to reassess uh, the property taxes on death uh, with a few exceptions. And so you want to consider those exceptions if you have appreciated uh, property. And for someone who is high net worth, uh, there is estate taxes as well. Estate taxes is a 40% tax on death, uh, but only for uh, high net worth individuals uh, who are above the exemption amount. And the exemption amount is very high. Uh, currently, it's about $13 million. So assets that are above that are taxed at 40%, which is a massive tax. Um, so it doesn't impact most people, but it does impact people. And so if that impacts you, then certainly you would want to think about it. And that is a moving target. Depending upon which party is in charge, it'll either go up or down the, the exemption amount, right? So, so that's something to always sort of keep in mind. All right, so what are, so look, any questions on this slide? Because this is a really important slide. These are the things we have to think about. Again, we're not giving you the solutions to your specific things. I just want you to know the frame of like what you have to consider when you're doing this planning. Okay, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll repeat the questions, it's okay. So uh, the, the question is, uh, I'm going to frame your question slightly differently to make them more generally applicable. Um, can we do planning that uh, avoids reassessment, essentially, right? That's, that's the question. And the answer is, in, in certain cases, yes, right? In certain cases, there's going to be scenarios where you cannot, right? Uh, because that's how the law is designed. It's not intended to just go forever. Uh, but there are plenty of planning opportunities where, in which Prop 19 is a very, very important consideration. And uh, a, a well-drafted estate plan can, uh, can account for that. And it should account for that, I think. Um, so um, these are documents that I think everyone should have. Okay? So when we think about an estate plan... These are documents that I think everybody should have. A will everyone's familiar with. Now, the will does a couple things. If you have minor children, that's where you name guardians. Allah forbid, if something were to happen to mom and dad, the last thing in the world that anybody would want for their children is to end up in the foster care system, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all afiyah and protect us. That's super important. You've got to designate a guardian. If you do nothing else, I mean, like, we're talking about wealth and inheritance and all of that, but this is just, like, just basics. If somebody has children that are minors, you've got to at least make sure that the guardianship piece is taken care of. The will, as we said, might not solve your inheritance problems because if you've got joint assets and you've got beneficiaries and all that stuff, it's largely going to go to the survivor or whoever's named there. Uh, but at least it will... Um, do the guardianship, and it might solve some people's uh, inheritance issues as well. Especially if you're not married and you don't um, and you don't have already beneficiaries on there. Power of attorney and healthcare directives are important in the event of incapacity. Most people don't die suddenly, so this whole time we've been talking about post death. But especially with advanced medicine, people tend to live longer, and they tend to also have a period of incapacity. Like most people don't die suddenly. So planning for that is important. And planning to avoid disputes 
uh, among family members over healthcare decisions is also really important. Um, and taking into consideration, are there any physicians here? Uh, was? Oh, this is like a different audience than I'm used to. So everybody's in tech here. So um, uh, the normal like masjid group audience is like you know full of doctors. So um, everybody's probably seen some family member or distant you know friend or whatever where there's this end of life discussion and what should we do? Do we pull the plug? Who's in charge? Who's making the decision? Like all that kind of stuff we would try to do in advance to try to um, mitigate disputes and use that time for du'a and such instead of disputes. And then a trust, okay? The trust is generally going to be a better solution for estate planning. So this was a question that was asked, I think maybe three or four questions at the beginning were about trusts. And I think that trusts are a much better solution for really anyone in California, because probate is very expensive, um, who has any sort of savings, but for Muslims in particular, uh, because you want to avoid the probate system and you can determine who owns what, like in this, inside of that trust. So let's talk about trusts. <clears throat> what is this trust? Does anybody have a trust? Good. Some people have trusts. Okay. Like, it's not just something for super rich people. Like, that's what it used to be, maybe, or it's considered, or that's what, you know, comes to mind, that you know, this is something for the ultra high net worth. Now, notice what is my title? Revocable living trusts. So there's all kinds of different trusts. There are revocable trusts and there are irrevocable trusts, okay? We're gonna talk about revocable trust first. That's basically the family trust. And what it is is a bucket that you create and you put your assets inside, okay? It's like an invisible wrapper. And the benefit is you put your stuff inside, you consolidate ownership of your assets, and you can also name that trust as the beneficiary. Remember we talked a lot about beneficiaries? So if you want to designate all the Sharia distributions and such, you can do so inside of that trust, and you can have your assets point to that trust, such that the trust will be the beneficiary upon death. Okay? Inside of the trust, you can define. So what happens? You can avoid probate. The trust itself never dies. Okay, so why do we go to probate? Because the owner of the asset is dead. Okay, Ahmed had a house. I want to buy Ahmed's house. What do we do? We have a contract. We have an exchange of money. We sign documents. Ahmed's not alive. I want to buy his house. That's where the probate court will come in, right? And in theory, it's protecting against fraud. It's doing all of these jobs. But really, it's just a super inefficient process. So the trust will not die. The house was in the trust. Now, Ahmed died, but what happened, he had named backup trustees in advance. He already had a list. When I die, it's going to be Sara. If Sara's not there, it's going to be Khalid. If Khalid's not there, it's going to be Aisha, whatever. Right? He's got this list of people. Either it's his children or his parents or his friends or whatever. Okay? And then we can distribute things Islamically. It's going to say, upon my death, I want to do A, B, and C. Okay? Now, it's also like sort of built in to account for changed circumstances. We can say, we don't know who's going to die. We don't know if, uh, what the order of deaths is going to be. So we can build all of that into the trust. The other thing is, if you have like property in three states, you'd have to do a probate in every state. So you can just multiply the probate costs because you've got these properties, and so you've got to now have ancillary probates in various jurisdictions. But if you have a trust, that trust can own property in various states. Okay, so there's like another advantage. I mean, um, there's different roles in the trust. There's what's known as a trustee, which is the person who manages the trust. And then there are beneficiaries, which are the people who are going to receive the distributions. So the Islamic heirs are the beneficiaries. The trustees are going to be the people who are going to manage it, the managers. And you make a list, right? So you can name, some people name their children, some people name friends, some people name parents, some people name professional advisors or trust companies whose job is just to administer trusts, right? So depending upon the situation, the complexity, all these different considerations, whether you have relatives, you know, some people might not have anyone that they can name, right? Um, I don't advise like naming like people that without asking. You know, some people come in, they're like, name the, they name the imam as the trustee, like <laughs> the poor guy. It's like, it's a burden, like to, to 
place on someone, especially if you don't discuss it with them, right? So you definitely want to have discussions. These are really important discussions to have. This point is super, super important. If you are married and you want to have a trust, do you set up one trust or do you set up two trusts? Is it a joint trust? Inside of that trust, who owns what? That's the first thing we do. Like when we have this, when we have an engagement is who owns what? Tell me what the ownership assets, what, what do you think as husband and wife, right? And does your wife think what you think and does your husband think what you think, right? We've got to be on the same page if you're married, right? Uh, very, very critical. Yes. Good. The question was, can the trustee and the beneficiary be the same person? They could, right? So, so oftentimes that is the case. Like it might be one of your children or so. Um, you have to trust that person. You really got to trust the trustee because remember there's potentially no oversight, right? Um, so they're legally bound. There might be a conflict of interest there um, or it might make a lot of sense. Maybe it's efficient. Maybe the most logical person is one of your children or maybe it's a two of the three of the children, whatever. So, so yes, the, the, there's no uh, rule prohibiting it. And oftentimes that is the case, uh, but sometimes it's not. And so every situation is, is really dependent upon who who is there and who who you trust to carry out your wishes. Can you have more than one trustee? The beauty of this trust is a very flexible instrument. You can have one trustee, you can have two, you can have ten. Obviously the more you have, the less likely anything is to get done and the more likely people are to fight. But that's checks and balances, right? So you you have some some balance. And again, this is I think why a lot of like this type of thing I, I don't think lends itself to sort of self-help, right? A lot of people are like, I'm a smart person, I will figure this out. And I really don't think that's the case here when it comes to this level of like planning. For simple stuff, absolutely, right? But the more that is involved, the more that, you know, it makes sense to discuss. Questions, other questions about, the, I, I think there were a lot of questions about the trust. So maybe I'll answer a few and you can ask more as well. So once you set this trust up, First off, generally, what is the ballpark of fees to set up a trust, right? That's the, maybe question number one. It's like buying a car, right? You can get like a wild range of fees. You can buy like a Tesla or you could buy like, you know, an old Corolla, right? Um, I, so there's going to be, you know, different levels and sophistication and assets and whatnot. But usually, like for a family trust, it's going to be somewhere in the range of three to $5,000, that gives you a ballpark. You might find some that are less. If you're a high net worth, you might find some that are going to be a lot more. Um, but that gives you some range of what you would expect for like a, you know, a, a, a well, like a, a, a good practitioner who knows what they're doing. Some, like I said, you might find some that are less and you might find some that are more, but that gives you a range, maybe 2,500 to 5,000, something like that. Now, you might say, what are the sort of, ongoing costs associated with set up, setting up a trust, okay? Well, number one, uh, it doesn't get registered with any state. It doesn't actually get filed. So it's like this entity that's created, but it doesn't get filed with the state while you're alive and well. So usually there should be no ongoing costs, like annual maintenance type costs. Some attorneys charge, you know, some sort of like maintenance fee and they say you, we charge annually and that includes like one update or one meeting or whatever. Some people do that. Uh, but it's not a requirement. Um, what we usually do is we say that, you know, think about this as a three to five year plan. If you were to pass in the three to five years, who are the people? What are the steps? Like, does this make sense? Right? We're not thinking 25 years down the road necessarily, but in the next three to five years, does this make sense? And then we come back every three to five years and we update it. But there may be life events that necessitate a update and generally those would be hourly type of updates uh, to, to make the updates. In some cases, they might be very significant updates and it might be a redo of the trust. Uh, also, if you have a trust, for example, that somebody else created that was not based on Sharia principles, a lot of people might have done trusts just to avoid probate and to kind of make sure that some of the goals are achieved, if not all of them, and you want to sort of add a halal stamp to it, um, that might require redoing it, that might require making updates to it, it might be an amendment, it just depends on sort of what's involved uh, with that trust. Um, and then as the trustee you can still buy, sell, add, subtract. 
Like in other words, you can sell your house and buy another house. You can do different things. You just have to do so in the capacity of, uh, as a trustee. Okay, so it seems like a foreign thing, like it's difficult, but it's really not that difficult. Those of you that have a trust, is it really hard to manage? Is it super hard to have a trust? No, it's really not that hard, okay? So um, once you set it up, then you get used to it and you just try to make sure that your trust is the owner or the beneficiary on all of your assets so that everything is wrapped inside of that trust. Good. So one question is about tax, yes? Yeah, so again, um, at least the way that we do it, every asset has to be disclosed uh, and identified. And again, that's otherwise, you know, you can go through this elaborate plan and then you die and your trustee doesn't have a clue what you have. Like, where does that person start? Like, we've had situations where people have died and the family just doesn't know what they had. And it's like a expedition to try to figure out what accounts they had and what, you know, firms and brokerage accounts. Not everything's on the tax return. And so, um, so it's hard. There's a lot of accounts are, will not show up anywhere um, if you're not getting dividends and whatever. So point is, if you try to make it easy, right? So you want to have a list. And maybe you update it once a year or once every few years or whatever. At least if you're 90% correct, the, the trustee will know what you have. And so we make sure that we have all the assets. With respect to taxes, we said at the outset, like a well-structured trust is intended to try to avoid taxes. We're trying to contemplate different taxes, property taxes, estate taxes, you know, capital gains, step up the basis, all these different considerations. Um, but no, generally when you're setting up a revocable trust, you don't need like to have your CPA approve a, a revocable trust because it's tax neutral. Um, on creation. It's not a taxable event. Um, but we like to work collaboratively with CPAs, like if you've got someone to make sure that you know advisor, other advisors are involved in the plan. Uh, but certainly if you're setting up an irrevocable trust, which would be a trust more so for tax planning or for asset protection, then uh, it's, it's, it's going to be more uh, likely that a CPA, uh, wealth manager perhaps, whatever, different advisors are involved in that, in that team planning. Yes? Yes, absolutely. The question was, uh, do you, once, yeah, once you set up a trust, do you need to change the title? And so a, one portion is we've got to have a list of assets, but that list by itself is not going to be good enough, right? You've actually got to change the title, okay? And so every asset's different. For property, that's a deed, right? For uh, bank accounts, that might be retitling for you know, brokerage accounts that might be retitling. For some accounts, it might be a beneficiary. So you got to go asset by asset, and then you've got to make sure that it, it, that process is called funding, which is making sure that your trust is uh, is actually holds assets. Um, uh, so, so it's an important process on the back end. What time is it? Nine thirty. Nine thirty. I see. Okay. So. Um, so that's something that's very important. Oftentimes people will create these trusts, but they won't transfer their assets into the trust. And then you have an unfunded trust, you might end up in probate. Which is, again, beat, defeats them. Both. It's a combination, right? Some things you have to do by yourself. For example, all of the financial accounts, like no law firm is going to be able to, you know, contact Chase for you and change your account or anything like that. Stuff you have to do by yourself. So there's usually some homework associated with setting it up. But think about it, if you don't do it, that would be stuff that people after you would have to do anyways, right? Like the family would still have to go through this complicated exercise of changing accounts and doing all these things and whatnot. And so you're basically doing their work for them in advance, right? So there's definitely some time investment along with a money investment on the front end. But the objective is that it's much more efficient on the back end. So that investment of both time, I always tell clients, it's, it's not just money, it's also time, right? Maybe you have a half day worth of account changes and phone calls and this and that. It's a lot easier now uh, than it was in the past where you had to send things in the mail and do all these things. A lot of this stuff can be done online. But nonetheless, there is definitely some work involved with funding your trust. Okay, so... Um, irrevocable, like I said, are more advanced. 
Um, so those are trusts that are done for tax planning, like advanced tax planning, especially estate taxes, uh, which would be um, for high net worth individuals who are above that $13 million exemption limit or who foresee themselves being above the $13 million exemption limit. Uh, and that limit is, is actually subject to drop in 2026 to 6 million. So it's actually, um, in the current law, under the current law, uh, uh, January 1, 2026, it would cut to um, 6 million. So who knows if that'll be the case, but that would, then the estate tax would impact far more people, right, at a 40% rate above the, the clip. So, um, so then it, this planning would be much more significant. Again, they might raise it, they might lower it, who knows, but it's something to be aware of that the exemption right now is 13 million coupled, 12.92 or whatever the exact number is, uh, and it goes up for inflation every year, but then it's supposed to get cut significantly in half uh, at the end of 2025. Um, okay, so um, to, to just to go back to this question, like this, this concept of estate planning we said is to preemptively plan. Whereas in the beginning, we talked about retroactively looking at our assets and distributing them. So our goal is to fulfill religious obligations. Now, most people's goal is also to protect their spouse, right? Like, especially if one spouse is not working, right? Making sure that we're not, uh, you know, uh, creating a situation where that spouse is left, like, with very little. Um, or an inability to, to, you know, have a maintain their standard of life and such. And so that's another consideration that comes in. Almost everyone, of course, with children wants to make sure their children are taken care of. Um, ensuring some level of family harmony. Um, everybody thinks that, well, not really everybody thinks that their kids will not fight. A lot of my clients think their kids will fight um, and they want to plan, but other people think their kids will not fight. Uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our families, but we want to make sure that we maintain family harmony and not create a situation where there's conflict and one of the best ways to do this is to create a plan and tell everybody this is what's going to happen and this is what's going to, you know, we, um, we have like this weird um, sort of belief in a lot of cultures, Muslim cultures, that like if we talk about death, we're going to die, right? Um, and so like families sometimes just never talk about death, even though it's so prevalent in our tradition. I mean, the Sheikh recited it in Maghrib, like that hakum with takathur, that like this want of more has deluded you. Hatta zurtum al maqabir. Like we're always thinking about more and this and that in different capacities. And then the ayah says, until you visit the graves. Like that's the, when the reality hits. Either like actual visit, like whenever you just go to the graveyard, you have this realization, or upon your death. And it's mentioned as zurtum al maqabir, like because it's not a permanent abode. It's just a, a place that you're going to be for a short while. Um, so that's important. We want to minimize taxes and fees. This is also interesting. Prevent squandering of wealth. So um, we don't want to, as a corollary to taking care of our children, we don't want to give them so much that they like become, they just lose their work ethic and they're just spoiled. Like, you know, this notion of trust fund children Everyone generally thinks that's a bad idea, right? And the Quran talks about this. Wala tu'tu sufaha amwalakum. The Quran talks about this, right? That don't give the sufaha your wealth. Like, don't give foolish heirs your wealth. And it's amazing. The Quran says, Wabtalu yatama. Test an orphan. What does that mean? Anyone know? What is the test? What do you do? This is like so profound. Give them a little bit of wealth and see what they do with it. It's financial management. You teach them before you give them a whole bunch of money. You see what they do with that money. Then what? Once you find that they've reached this age of rushd, now they have this financial acuity, they know what to do with money, then you give them their wealth. Okay? Now what is that age? What, what does that look like? What are the parameters? Coming to the question of a special needs child, 
right? So, so maybe there would be a situation where somebody might never reach rushd, in which case you would have a trustee manage their money for them, right? So this is really important, if, especially in the case of special needs. Um, there's a lot of government benefits that are available in the case of a special needs child. And sometimes if you give them wealth as an inheritance, it would disqualify them from receiving those benefits, right? Because some of those tests are means-based, at least once they reach the age of 18. And so again, this planning also has to be considered at that point. Do not use the Kids. elevator. Use stairwells where necessary. All handicapped occupants... This is why estate plans are important. <coughs> Alright, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahmadu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-Kareem. Picking up, inshallah, for a few minutes before Aisha. Um, Alhamdulillah, that it was not... Um, it was not an emergency, Alhamdulillah. And uh, just goes to show you that um, we really don't know uh, when uh, anything could happen. And so therefore, we should be prepared at any moment. You taking off? OK. Um, um, so the last few points I just wanted to cover. Again, this, this uh, if you are trying to create a plan you can reach out and we can do that separately. But with respect to like, general questions, um, there were two or three things I wanted to cover. One was planning for illiquid assets is something that we should really consider, um, especially partnership assets. If someone has a business, um, whether it's a family business or it's a business between partners, that's when contracts and written contracts are super important. Quran says, وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ وَقَلِيلٌ مَا هُمْ So contracts inherently, partnerships, are situations where people often are unjust to one another. Uh, and the Quran says, except for uh, few who are righteous and do good deeds. So um, if anybody has a partnership or, or such, uh, that's something that you would definitely want to have a plan for succession. Or if you have this family business, you also want to have a plan for succession. Um, so uh, a trust really helps in that regard and also maybe more comprehensive business succession plan. There was a question about converts in particular. Um, what it happens if a person doesn't have Islamic heirs? So remember we said that inheritance law deals with the decedent and their, the decedent being the person who dies and their wealth or their assets or their stuff and the people that are left behind. Now those people, the mandatory heirs uh, from the, the waratha, from the, the fara'id category, they have some conditions that are required in order for them to, um, rather there are some disqualifiers of inheritance, I should say. So we talked about these relationships. There are basically two ways in our present time which, in which somebody could be disqualified from being an heir. Uh, the first is if they are not Muslim. Okay, so the shares for the mom and the children and the wife and the husband and, and parents and so on and so forth uh, from the mandatory shares uh, require that they are Muslim. And if they're not Muslim, they can, do not inherit from this share. Now, what does that give you the opportunity to do? To utilize which share? That will see it, that one-third share. So if somebody has non-Muslim relatives that they would like to gift and support, they can, but through that will see a share. Um, and also which all never happens, but uh, also if somebody kills you, they don't inherit from you either. Um, so the second category would be the killer uh, is also uh, eliminated from inheritance. Um, it's actually consistent with state law. You can't kill someone for an inheritance. Um, so that is uh, present in Islamic inheritance law as well. Uh, now, but if somebody has no heirs, uh, no Islamic heirs, uh, so they have no Muslim relatives whatsoever, um, Basically, there's a long list of people. You keep going further and further remote, right? From the the Quranic heirs to the Asaba, and then eventually, in, according to Hanafis, at least the, the Widarham, and then to the Muslim treasury, 
uh, the Beit al-Mal, right? And we don't have that. So then it would go to basically charities that um, would substitute in. Um, and some scholars allow in that scenario, basically, if you have no heirs and there is no Muslim treasury, then you can basically do whatever. Because you don't have, um, you're not violating anybody's rights. Islamic inheritance is based on rights. And so if nobody's entitled to inherit, then you basically have discretion with your estate if, uh, for somebody who doesn't have any Muslim heirs. Um, but this is something to run by with a scholar to make sure that um, your unique situation is accounted for. Um, now, if someone is well off, there was a question about, well, you know, what if this person doesn't need anything? Islamic inheritance is not based on need. It's an entitlement. Okay? If that person doesn't want it, they're free to disclaim it. Okay? But it's a, it's, it's, it, it, it is a God-given right. Right? You didn't do anything to deserve it. But Allah gives these rights. And so if a person says, I don't want it, I don't need it, and I'm going to donate it to charity so that my you know, parent gets sadaqah reward for it, or I want to help my less fortunate sibling uh, who is in more financial need or some other more distant relatives or whatever, all of that is free to happen after death. Anybody can you know, give away their shares and do whatever they want with them. But um, that's got to be voluntary. And you can't do it for them. So you can't look at your children and be like, well, you know, my son, he's good. My daughter, she is more in need. So I'm going to cut my son out. And I'm going to give everything to my daughter. Even if your intention is good. Your intention is like, oh, I want to help her. But you need to help her in your lifetime. And uh, you need to not uh, change the rules upon death. Okay? Anything else? We're about to break for Salah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so a good estate plan will account for contingencies, right? We never know who's going to die when. And so we basically would say in this scenario A, there is this, but in scenario B, there's a different result. Um, and that's, that, that would be something that would be accounted for in a good plan, yes. Most of the examples are like one spouse dies and then the next spouse dies, but you know, may Allah protect us. If something were to happen concurrently, the result would be very different, um, and that possibility has to be accounted for when drafting a plan. All right, so I think uh, we'll stop here for Salah, inshallah. And if you have more specific questions, you can feel free to reach out, inshallah. If you would like to set up your plan or you would like to update your existing plan to make it Sharia compliant, um, inshallah, feel free to reach out. Uh, I am based in Arizona, not in California. Uh, however, I am licensed in California, and nowadays we can do everything remotely, as you all are accustomed to doing. Um, so it's not really a big problem. And inshallah, uh, we'd be happy to assist. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept uh, from you all for this gathering and overlook and forgive my shortcomings. Uh, subhanakallah wa alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Jazakumullah khairan.